Welcome to episode 42 of the Liberty Dad podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you're new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom, all the time. And Dad represents the delivery, recognizing that tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today, and applying that to those around me. I'm your host, DL. And this episode is Pillars of Libertarianism, Self-Ownership. The last five episodes were on race-related matters. It may not have sounded much like a talk on liberty, but rather than talk about how we communicate as people. And that's because this show is about communicating the message of liberty differently. Whether it's something that maybe doesn't get tempers quite as flared, like say, public libraries, or whether it's a hot button race item like race relations, the idea of communication is always at the forefront. Much of the conversation in those last episodes was dedicated to the broader ideas of communication that were presented under the discussion of race, but applicable in any conversation. In this episode, I start with the first of a series on what I believe are pillars of libertarianism. That said, let's dive right in. In this series, I discuss what I believe are the three pillars that, that are fundamental to libertarianism. These pillars are self-ownership, the non-aggression principle, and freedom of association. These aren't presented to be bulletproof philosophical arguments. If you're watching and you're a non-libertarian, you might have wondered what's going through the mind of a libertarian when they take the stand that they do on any given issue. If you're a libertarian, you might also have wondered what's going on in the mind of a non-libertarian who just cannot see what feels like the obvious answer to whatever conversation that you two are having. Instead of a great philosophical musing, this series is meant to help non-libertarians understand a bit why we believe the way that we do and take such stalwart and uncompromising positions. It's also meant to provide a different approach for libertarians who are talking to their friends and family members who aren't libertarian. Now, the first question that someone might have is, why would you boil it down to these three concepts, and these ones specifically? Well, the first reason is that any time you can break something down into threes, it's easier to communicate and easier for people to remember. The second reason is that these are the most common concepts that I believe impact the day-to-day -day conversations on most issues that people talk about and they're the most relevant to the various laws that are passed or the ones that we argue about. And then lastly, I think that once people have a simple foundation to work with, conversations that get more complex are a bit easier to understand and discuss. And most conversations that libertarians and non-libertarians have end up going from simple to complex really quickly. For instance, I'll give you an example. If I were to say that I oppose licensing laws, which I do, and then discuss the absurdity of barbers and hairstylists who must first go through training and various legal hoops before opening up shop, it's inevitable that someone is going to leap to ask if I want an unlicensed brain surgeon operating on me. And so with that in mind, let's go ahead and begin. Let's start with what I believe is the most fundamental concept for any libertarian. Self-ownership. Self-ownership is simply the unequivocal right of ownership of your own body. Because you own your own body, you own that which it produces. If I were to square off a lot in my yard, prepare it, plant vegetables, water it every day, the vegetables that are produced are mine to do with as I please. I can sell them for any price that another is willing to pay. I may give them away. I may eat them all for myself or I may toss them in the compost pile for some other reason. This ownership idea leaves the sole decision for any matter concerning my body to me. Therefore, I may choose to drink only water or some sugar-laden soda. Maybe I choose to drink alcohol or any other beverage. I may also eat anything that I choose, and I can determ determine what other substances go into this body. If I choose to, say, smoke marijuana 
or even take an aspirin. It is my body, and therefore, I alone am at liberty to decide what goes in it. And if I alone bear the choice to bring a substance into my body, well, then I also have the right to choose otherwise. Because this right to bring a substance into your body is incomplete without also having the right to choose not to. When my mother was dying of cancer, she rejected various medications. For her, the side effects were too great, and it reduced the quality of her life to such an extent that she preferred the consequences of refusing them. It was painful to watch. In some small way, maybe a big way, it hurt because I knew the drugs were possibly the best option at either some uh, at recovery or at least prolonging her life, which both would have given me time with her. But the decision was entirely hers because it was her body that it would be affecting, and ultimately her quality of life. Any benefit to me would have been my own, but it would have been but without personally experiencing the first-hand results of that decision. And that, I believe, is the key. If I take an aspirin to quell a headache, my wife may benefit by me not being as grouchy. But that only happens after the aspirin takes effect and relieves me of the headache. If I choose to sell vegetables from my garden, or give them away, dispose of them, or any other action, my hungry neighbor may have their hunger satisfied if they were the beneficiary of the vegetables in some way, but only after that I decided to move them from my possession to theirs and under whatever arrangement that we come up with. That is, I will feel good about my decision before they even take the first bite. And likewise, with my mother, who chose not to take certain medication, before I could benefit from any more time with her, or even more enjoyable time, she would be the one to first feel the results of her decision. Consider this point in addition. The biggest impact is always to the person whose body is directly being affected. Anyone else who is affected is secondary, at best. If my neighbor offers to give, sell, or trade their vegetables to me, we do so on agreed terms. Forcing that option would mean that they might be or would likely be resentful for not only being forced to do something that they didn't want to otherwise do, but also for what, the, what they would have preferred that to do that they now cannot do. Likewise, had someone forced my mother to take the medication that she did not want, she might resent me or that person for going against her will and she might be upset now how the medication feel. And then following that point, when people equally have control over their own bodies, everyone can best adapt to meet the needs of the group as a whole. My neighbor may choose to discard vegetables into a compost pile that they intend to use for some other purpose. I want to digress here. I don't really know a whole lot about compost piles. And therefore, it may sound absurd to those who do know that someone would grow vegetables only to go and toss them into a compost pile. But that would be a process problem. The principle here still remains the same. Go back to my analogy. If my neighbor chooses to dispose of vegetables into their compost pile, I would, I would not gain the benefit of eating them, whether for free, for cost in trade of something. But my other neighbor, might choose to grow vegetables and sell them cheaply to all of the neighbors. And that neighbor, they may have poor soil and benefit from my first neighbor's compost pile. And since my first neighbor isn't growing vegetables to provide to others, my second neighbor has the incentive to use their body and time to produce vegetables for me and everyone else. Likewise, in the example of my mother, when she refused medication, I knew her condition would likely deteriorate. And because of that, I put in a greater effort to visit. Every time that I got word that she worsened in any way, whether it was a worsening uh, of test results or even just feeling worse than she did maybe the prior week, I made haste and went to see her. I visited my mother four times in 2016 before she passed in November. One can only speculate, but the question I might ask is, had she taken the medication? I might have chalked up her 
poor responses as just issues with the strong medication. And maybe instead of four times, maybe only visited three times, thinking that she just needed more rest. Time. I will never know. I do know that her decision changed and I adapted accordingly. Now, I will say, I'm painting a bit of a rosy picture here. Things don't always work out to produce such desirable results. But when we disrespect the ownership of a person's body, we always damage the relationship on that side. That damage can have a lasting impact. That person may be less inclined to interact in other ways with us. They may change their behavior such that whatever benefit we gain for forcing their action is now diminished. In the analogy of our garden, they may work a little less harder, therefore produce less yield. And I believe it's morally wrong to impose our own will upon someone else when we really wouldn't want that for ourselves. Since the actions between people are infinite, and we do not have the capacity to rank them all, it must be an all or none situation. And even if we could count and rank all the interactions between people, these rankings may change because of other actions that we are simply unable to predict. If I force, that, if I force my first neighbor to produce vegetables instead of filling his compost pile, my second neighbor may not decide to work a garden. And it's likely that the second neighbor would produce a better garden, possibly with more yield, because they're doing it for enjoyment. When we are left to make our own decisions about our own bodies, the results are better. Not always. A man who chooses to drink excessively may very well become an alcoholic who harms his family. Fortunately, life is never without negative consequences. By keeping focused, Self-ownership, that means each individual may choose what they do with their own body and how the fruit of what they produce with their own body. We create a society where the maximum number of people benefit. Because the maximum number of people are doing what they choose to do and are likely to put a better effort into achieving a meaningful outcome. But ultimately, when libertarians support things like sex work, or decriminalization of drugs, or oppose things like mandatory vaccinations, or taxation, here frequently, or the many other things that fall into either of those two categories. They do so because they simply believe that each person owns their own self, and any violation of that is immoral. Anything that's a benefit after that fact is simply a bonus. If you're watching and you're a libertarian, Consider developing your own examples to explain self-ownership. Do so in a way that you can relate to many different examples so that people can see how your view of self-ownership is consistent and how it's applicable in many different areas. And do so in a way that illustrates violating it in one area breaks down the entire concept, no matter how seemingly admirable. If you're watching and you're not a libertarian, consider how the idea of self-ownership must be consistent in order to have value. Consider how a violation in one area is similar to a breach in the structural integrity for everyone. Think about different examples that you've personally experienced and apply the thoughts from this episode. Try and imagine the consequence of violating it in an area where you think it's well served and then try to imagine how that may open the door to violate it in an area where you think it is not well served. Whoever you are, whatever your political stripe or philosophical position, I hope you gained some insight in this episode. If you're a libertarian, I hope this episode gives you a different way to present your ideas to others. If you're a non-libertarian, I hope that you better understand why libertarians can be so unwavering on this matter. And definitely leave a comment from wherever you're watching from and be sure to join me in the next two episodes where I discuss Aggression principle and freedom of association. But for now, let's go ahead and have a bill review. But I know I'll be a law someday, at least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. I am not in any way a lawyer. What follows is not in any way legal advice and is not intended to speak in any authority on legal matters. I am only acting in the capacity of a general citizen with the ability to read and interpret a concatenation of words and render an opinion. The goal of the bill review 
is to promote the idea that everyday Americans can and should take the time to read any legislation, order, or mandate. I'm not a lawyer. This isn't a legal interpretation, and I may be wrong. Bills range from a page or two to many thousands of pages long. And since they can be rather dry, this segment is short and only meant to show you just how much you can learn in only a few minutes. This episode, I'm going to review House Resolution 2211, introduced by Representative Janice Sikowski of Illinois. The bill states that this is, quote, an act to require the Consumer Product Safety Commission to promulgate a consumer product safety rule for freestanding clothing storage units to protect children from tip-over related death or injury and for other purposes, end quote. This act is titled as the Stop Tip-Overs of Unstable Risky Dress Dressers on Youth Act, or the Sturdy Act. You know, politicians love their acronyms. I sometimes wonder if they write their bills thinking that the acronyms will give the idea of more credibility. Who knows? So what does this legislation do? Like many pieces, any benefits are indirect. It requires that within one year of passage, the Consumer Product Safety Commission shall put out a product safety standard for clothing storage units, dressers. That standard must include the following four items. One, tests that simulate the weight of children up to 60 pounds. Two, provide repeatable tests that simulate real-world use on multiple flooring types with items in the drawers and one or more open drawers. Three, testing for all clothing storage units, including any under 30 inches. Finally, warning requirements, presumably labels. If this then goes for, uh, it then goes in to provide future rulemaking and updates based on various agencies, such as the CDC's clinical growth charts. You might be thinking, Liberty Dad, you're a father, and you have a beautiful two-year-old son, Liberty son. Surely, you are not opposed to this bill, and you would be incorrect. I first came across this bill through a tweet from Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut. He tweeted this, quote, the furniture industry has been allowed to self-regulate far too long and with tragic consequences. A child is injured by tipped furniture every 17 minutes. Passing the Sturdy Act would enact strong furniture stability standards to prevent deadly tip-overs and protect children." End quote. A little bit of research, and I found that there's a website called StopTipOvers.org, an organization dedicated to the passage of this Sturdy Act. The website says this, quote, according to the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, a child dies every 11 days in the U.S. TV or piece of furniture falls on them, end quote. And there's a video on their website that reports that a child is sent to the ER every 60 minutes following a tip-over accident. That's roughly 8,760 children per year. And later in the video, a woman indicates that since the year 2000, 451 children have died from furniture or a television tip-over related accidents. A death every 11 days results in about 33 children per year. Any child that dies is most certainly a tragedy. And while it's tempting to maybe dismiss the 33 children as not that many or maybe blame the parents, we can do better when considering whether legislation is a good idea or not. And while we want to be mindful of trivializing numbers, since advocates are using these numbers, then we should evaluate them fairly. Senator Blumenthal says that a child dies every 11 days. The video on StopTipOvers.org says 451 children have died since 2000. Death every 11 days is about 33 annually, but 451 divided by 20 years is 23 per year. Further into the video, a woman claims that 11,300 children visit the ER each year on average for furniture tip-over injuries. And that too differs from the beginning of the video, which claims that a child is sent to the ER every six minutes. That's one per hour, 365 days per year for a total of 8,760. So already the data being presented is inconsistent and by a significant amount. Is that enough to oppose this bill? I don't think so. Data can be difficult. What constitutes a major injury in one set of data may be viewed differently in a different set of data. I do think that proponents should present data consistently as it does help evaluate any situation objectively. 
inconsistent collection or presentation of data can easily cause us to seek out the wrong solution. That isn't the reason that I oppose this bill. It just adds to my opposition. Video, and in Senator Blumenthal's tweet, we see one claim repeatedly made. It goes something like this. The Sturdy Act would prevent tip overs and would have prevented a given child's death because it would provide testing and safety standards for furniture manufacturers to follow. But ask yourself, to name one safety standard that's been implemented in the United States that has met such a standard. And that standard, by their own words, is that it would have prevented this particular person's death. The answer to that is none. A legal safety standard may reduce deaths, but never to zero. OK, DL, doesn't have to be perfect, right? Even if it saves one life, isn't it worth it? We're talking about children here. Well, if that's your response, I'm glad you brought it up. We are talking about our children. They deserve our best. So I leave you thinking about this question. Is it our best to impose a law that tells parents your child is now safe because of it? I want you to really think about that question. Our best is to tell parents they no longer must worry about tip overs because we've implemented safety standards. And if that standard fails their child, who is to blame for misleading the parent to a false sense of security? Many parents will tell you, as my wife and I are both learning, having a child takes constant vigilance. And even then, tragedies happen. What I don't see on the stop tipovers.org website or anywhere in various news articles on the bill or topic is how after compiling all the data, we've determined that passage of this bill is determined to be the best solution for child tip overs. Until that happens, we are not giving children our best. That's all for this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air. Head on over to trovo.live forward slash free speech media, where the weekly episode of Just Me airs Monday night at 10 p.m. Join Josh Fields from the Libertarian Apothecary and me on Friday night at 11 p.m. for a discussion-style episode of the same topic. While you're there, be sure to check out other free speech media shows. And remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people, and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time. And I'm out.